Today we're going to talk about one of the most challenging and most complex issues that we face in the human life. It's the topic of change. And looking back on our years of ministry, I'd have to say that I've seen some amazing changes in the lives of people. And we rejoice in that, we celebrate that, we're so thankful. Uh, when it comes to leaving the darkness and coming into the light, uh, I would say I've gotten to see some changes in the way of deliverance and healing and reconciliation. But I would also have to take it a step further and say, unfortunately, I've seen my share of disappointments uh, in this regard as well. There are some who not only resisted change, but who decided to return in their lifestyle to some old destructive habits, and uh, they chose that over proceeding in a positive direction in their life. Sometimes I think that people uh, choose to remain in the darkness rather than walk in the light. It's, it's easier that way. That's what they're used to. It's what they've grown accustomed to. But there's no substitute for the joy that comes from seeing somebody make those personal spiritual decisions that will uh, revolutionize their life, that will lead to true uh, inside-out transformation. I would also uh, want to point out foundationally as we get started today that change always begins with a decision. Change always begins with a decision. In Luke chapter 15, uh, the Bible tells us that even the angels in heaven rejoice when one sinner repents. Okay, that has to do with change, the decision to change, because repentance carries with it the idea that I'm not only sorry for my sin, but I'm sorry enough to change. That kind of transformation is something that money cannot buy, and it is a change that people cannot legislate. It is a change that people cannot mandate for others. It is something that only we can decide for ourselves. But we can't do it for ourselves. It's a change that only God can bring once we've made the decision to allow him to do his work in our life. But it's up to all of us to decide whether or not we're going to allow God to begin that transformation that moves us from darkness to light. It's important to notice that God does not force himself upon, himself upon us. We get to choose. He doesn't uh, make us do what he wants us to do. He offers us the opportunity and then we decide for ourselves. We determine whether or not we're ready to choose a new path for our lives. And what a blessing it is to see positive changes happen in marriages, in families, in individual lives when that decision is made. Uh, I would say that as I've been asked the question, what do you enjoy most about the ministry? That would be my answer. For over 30 some years, life change. That's what it's all about. I love to see the transformation that God wants to bring in the lives of his people. That's what makes ministry meaningful and fun. And uh, that brings up the obvious question. It's a question I want you to think about this morning. Why do people change? Why have you chosen to change? If there's an area in your life, a, a major transformation has taken place, what brought that about? What caused you to make that transformation? What made that decision happen? What is the catalyst for coming out of the darkness and into the light that's found only in Jesus Christ? What kind of uh, you know, events or circumstances, what does it take for real transformation like that to happen in your spiritual life? I would suggest to you that deep, lasting change is often connected to a defining moment in our lives. It's often connected to a defining moment. Typically, there's that defining moment when a person determines that something has to change, and that's when they choose a new path for their life. This morning, I want you to hear a very familiar story. It's a story that probably most of you have heard before. But I want you to try to step back and uh, not jump to the end of the story, not jump to the conclusion, but just try to hear this story like you're hearing it for the very first time today. It's the story of a father and a son, and it's about a defining moment that changed everything. And it's in Luke chapter 15, I'm going to read from the message. Then he said, there was once a man who had two sons, this is Jesus teaching, the younger said to his father, father... I want right now what's coming to me. So the father divided the property between them. It wasn't long before the younger son packed his bags and left for a distant country. There, undisciplined and dissipated, he wasted everything he had. Afterward, he uh, had gone through all his money. There was a bad famine all through the country, and he began to hurt. He signed on with a citizen who assigned him to his fields to slop the pigs. He was so hungry he would have eaten the corn cobs and the pig slop but no one gave him any. That brought him to his senses. He said, all those farmhands working back at my father's, they sit down to three meals a day and here I am starving to death. 
I'm going back to my father and I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against God. I've sinned before you. I don't deserve to be called your son. Take me on as a hired hand. He got right up and went home to his father. When he was still a long way off, his father saw him. His heart pounding, he ran out and embraced him and kissed him. The son started his speech. Father, I've sinned against God. I've sinned before you. I don't deserve to be called your son ever again. But the father wasn't listening. He was calling to his servants, quick, bring a clean set of clothes and dress him. Put the family ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then get a grain-fed heifer and roast it. We're going to feast. My son is here, given up for a dead and now alive. We're going to have a wonderful time. He was given up for lost, now is found, and they began to have a wonderful time together. I absolutely love that story. It's one of my favorites in the New Testament because it is packed with such emotion and so many amazing spiritual principles uh, that apply to all of our lives, really. The prodigal son took off with his father's money, blew it. He ended up friendless and penniless, living in a pig pen. And, but then in Luke 15, 17, there's a great line. It jumps off the page at me every time I read it. It says, then he came to his senses. He came to his senses. That is the defining moment that I was talking about earlier. That's, uh, you know, that moment after reflecting on the condition of his life, he begins to ask himself some questions. Where's my life headed? You ever ask yourself that? Where's my life headed? Is this really what I want to do? Is this really who I want to be? He asked some questions we all need to ask and, and we need to answer. Is the road that I'm traveling now, is the road that I'm traveling this day, is it taking me to where I want to be in the future? I mean, could he anticipate his future being brighter if he stayed on the road that led him to the pig pen? I mean, we all need to think about that. Can our future be any brighter if we stay on the road that has led us to the mess we're in today? He reflected on his life. He admitted he'd made a mess. He knew something had to give, and he was beginning to realize that what he'd been doing wasn't working. And so he began thinking about a different life. It would be a better life for him. In this case, uh, it was a life that he'd already had. It was the life that he'd walked away from. He had left this life. He began reflecting on his past and thinking about three square meals a day and having a roof over his head, and I'm sure he thought about how much he missed his family. He had to wonder how he uh, got in this pig pen. What was he doing here? Why did he leave the comforts of home in the first place? And then he does this little cost-benefit analysis. He, he evaluates his current condition. He considers all the options that are before him that day, and he weighs the pros and cons of each. And then he thinks about the price he had paid to leave home. And then he had to think about the price he would pay to stay put, to stay in the pig pen. He had to think about the price he would pay if he went home. And there'd be a price to pay even to go back home. You know, we don't always talk about that, but he would have to swallow his pride and he would have to realize that going home was going to require a good dose of humility. We don't discuss it a lot, but that's true. And there's also plenty of risk with going back home. I mean, what if his father rejected him? I mean, what if he, he's not welcome when he gets there? What if he's not allowed to stay? He'd burn a lot of bridges and there were no guarantees. But on the upside, he would love to leave that pig pen once and for all. And man, the thought of a home-cooked meal had to sound really good. Who doesn't miss their mother's cooking? And who, uh, who doesn't love having a roof over their head? And so maybe, maybe, just maybe he could reconcile with his dad. And so after weighing the pros and cons, he came to a conclusion. There was a moment of decision. We would call it a defining moment. He came to his senses. He decided to take action. He gets up out of the pig pen and he takes a shower and he heads home. And his life was truly changed in that defining moment. And it all started for the prodigal son when he came to his senses. Whenever somebody experiences a major positive change in their life, a change that leads to growth in faith or character or some other area, it almost always, almost always goes back to a defining moment in their lives. I've heard people refer to it as a wake-up call. 
It could be a lot of things. But it's in that instance they say, I came to my senses. It is uh, that moment of uh, pain or guilt, or it's that time when boredom or emptiness or defeat or loss or fear or frustration eventually drives us to a pivotal defining moment where we do some kind of a variation of what the prodigal son did. We begin reflecting on our lives and we make a decision. And the decision is we don't want the future to look like the past. Some of you have been there and made that kind of choice. We stand uh, there with the thought of, of living the rest of our lives like we're presently living and we can't tolerate it. We can't stand facing the future with so much guilt or so much pressure or so much pain and we don't wanna keep telling the same lives we've been telling and we don't wanna live in a life of isolation or self-reproach or, or fear and, and you can just fill in the blank with so many different things but you finally come to the place where you say, hey, I will not walk into the future living like I've been living in the past. I'm done with that. I'm not going to live like this anymore. I'm leaving the darkness and I'm making a willful choice today that I am going to walk into the light. And it's in that moment that God brings us a wave of such mercy and grace and hope. I believe it's in that moment that God provides us with a vision of a better life. There's something better than this. And maybe that's where you've been living your life today. You've been thinking there's got to be something better than this. And it's in that moment people begin to imagine a future filled with hope and possibility. It's where they do a little cost-benefit analysis of their own. And they begin asking questions like, you know, what would I have to give up? What would I have to let go of? What must come to an end in my life? Who do I need to disassociate with? Will it be worth it? And I'm sorry to say I've seen some people who have chosen to go back to the pig pen. It's what they were used to. They didn't know anything else. It's what they had become accustomed to. And, and uh, sometimes for some people, old problems are preferred over new solutions. And so instead of deciding to launch out into the future and take the risk of walking in a new way and to a new day, they decide it might not work. It might not even be worth it. And so what they may have is undesirable, but at least it's certain. At least I know what it looks like. At least I know what it means. And since there are no guarantees, they just decide, you know what? I'm going to stay put. I'm just going to keep things like they are. And it's so sad when that happens because they attempt to define their personal misery and redefine it. And the, the prodigal son, though, he chose a new path for his life. And that's what I want to invite some of you to consider doing this very day. The prodigal son decided to take action and he decided to discard the old way of life in favor of something new and in his case, something so much better. He decided to leave the darkness and he decided to head into the light. And in that moment, he climbed over the fence and headed home. And as you think about his life, do you, do you imagine looking back, do you think he could still remember that final day in the pig pen? I mean, 10 or 15 years after the fact, looking back, do you think he could remember exactly what was going on in his heart and his mind that day in the pig pen? Do you think that he could tell you the story of what happened that day and the processes that he went through? Do you think he'd be able to describe how he felt when he climbed over the fence and was leaving the pig pen for the last time? Of course he could, because it was a defining moment in his life. He's never going to forget that day. 10 to 15 years later, do you think he could still remember what it was like to get back home, to catch the first glimpse of the father's house? Do you think that he could imagine, would he remember the emotion that flooded his soul when he saw his dad come running to meet him? When you're ready for a genuine life change and you have come to your senses, that's when you're ready to take a step of faith. You may have to resign something. You may have to end something. You may have to get rid of some stuff. You may have to delete some old phone numbers. You may have to get rid of some things in your closet or decide to move out of a destructive setting or end a certain relationship. You'll have to decide to slam the door on the darkness of the past. 
And as you take a step of faith that leads in the direction of the bright new future God has in store for you, things begin to look incredibly different. And you are the only one who can make that decision for you. There have been times that I've seen it where I would love to make that decision for somebody else because I knew it would be the right decision, but only you can make it for you and only I can make it for me. You get to decide, I get to decide if we'll take that step of faith. Are we ready to step away from those things, those habits, those people, those environments that harm us? And are we really ready to walk in the direction of the one who loves us so much? I'll tell you this. People don't drift into positive life change. You may think you'll just kind of gradually coast into it and one of these days things will look different, but I want to tell you, people don't drift into positive life change. People don't float aimlessly through life and then one day wind up full of faith and living for God and living the life that he's called them to live. See, people never drift upward, we drift downward. We never drift in a positive direction, we drift in a negative direction. We never drift toward what's good for us. We drift toward what's bad for us. And so the decision that I'm talking to you about today, it is a positive on purpose decision that we can all make. It doesn't just happen. You have to choose it. You choose the path of faith. You won't drift toward a better life. You choose a better life. The drift always takes us further and further away from God's best for us. You have to fight for it because it's not easy. It's not easy at all, but it can be done with God's help. And so he'll provide you the power to do what you could never do on your own. The point is, you just can't sit back and wait for those desired changes to take place in your life. And that's why we're calling this series Called Out. Because we believe God is calling us out. Calling you and me out from a life of darkness to a life of filled with light. And it is up to us to aggressively step out and move in the direction that we need to go, whatever that looks like and whatever that means in your life. That's the way to see change happen, but so many people never get there. They never see that kind of change. And the reason is, the reason why that doesn't happen is because change is never easy. I mean, that's just the truth. It's not always easy. It's not for the faint of heart. In fact, if we're honest, change can be downright difficult. There's a high price to pay for change. You'll you'll come to numerous moral crossroads in your life. You'll have to reaffirm the decision to change again and again and again. And that's, uh, you know, always going to be difficult because there's an easier path to take. It's called the path of least resistance. You go off to college and you decide, I'm going to live a certain way. I'm going to live a certain life. And that decision to live a clean life or a pure life, that decision is going to be challenged and you're going to have to reaffirm again and again and again the decision to take the high road and to do the right thing because there will always be an easier path. But I want you to know that there is a path that is right and you can choose to take the high road. You can choose to do the right thing. You can choose to make the right choice. It's a tough choice and it'll seem like a lonely choice at times. But it's a courageous choice. And I tell you this, it's always right. It's always right to say yes to the call of God. Whatever it is that God's calling you to, to brighter, to better, It's always right to say yes to the call of God. I I mean, it's no wonder the Bible says that all heaven breaks out in a cosmic celebration whenever a single sinner repents and turns to follow Christ. I love that passage. All heaven rejoices. You know, whenever a person turns their back on destruction, whenever a person turns their back on brokenness, whenever a person turns their back on addiction or hopelessness or sin and decides to follow Jesus, when a person decides to leave the lies for the truth, when a person walks away from greed to generosity, when a person walks away from hatred and chooses to walk in a spirit of love, these are monumental moments. And I believe these are moments that causes heaven to rejoice and to celebrate. See, there's no greater victory to be celebrated than those quiet hidden moments when somebody makes a decision to live their life for Jesus. Maybe you're just a few decisions away from coming to your senses and changing some things in your life. Maybe you've been in the pig pen for a long time. 
But today you would, you would be able to say, you know what, Steve, God's been speaking to me. God's been challenging me. God's been moving me in a new direction. God's been nudging me. And you've been listening and you're coming to your senses and you know the future's you know, gonna look bad if you continue down the road you're on and you don't want that. It's, you know that the future's gonna look a whole lot like your past and, and it's probably gonna just look a lot worse, in fact, and there's a downward spiral. And, but today, but today, you've been called out. And today, as God speaks to you and as you respond to him and as you make a decision that you'll be glad you made for you and that you'll be glad you made for your family, today, you can take action. You can can make a decision. You can choose the light over darkness. It's entirely up to you. Are you ready to embrace the power of God and walk towards something new and good? Or are you ready to make the decision you will be glad you made for all eternity? It all begins with a decision. It begins with a decision to change. I understand there's more to change than just making one decision, but that's where it has to begin, that decision to say yes to God. And then that lasting change, if it's going to take place in our lives, there are some other supporting decisions that we have to make as well. They'll have to be made on a consistent basis. But for instance, there's a decision to rearrange my priorities, my, you know, rearrange my daily habits. I, I've got to get some things in a, in a new mode of operation. You'll have to rearrange those habits in ways that support and sustain the challenges and the changes that you want to make in your life. First Timothy chapter four, verse seven says to train yourself to be godly. Have you ever thought about what that looks like or what that means for you to train yourself to be godly? See, life change on this level is a very personal decision. It requires a very personal commitment. We have to take responsibility for ourselves. And the good news is God's gonna do his part to help you. God will do his part. He's gonna ask you to take responsibility for doing your part. And your part includes uh, putting together a training routine that involves rearranging some practices and engagements for your everyday life that will support you in the long-term decision, the long-term goal that you have to change your life for the good. Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, train yourself to be godly. And then he went on to say in 1 Timothy 4, 7, for physical training is of some value, but godliness, you talk about training, you can go to the gym every day you want. That's of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. What's it going to take for you to grow in godliness? We're unique and there are several, you know, things that may be different for you than for me, but there are some common practices that we should all be aware of as we think about what it means to rearrange our daily habits. There are some things we all need to do, and the first one is worship. We need personal and private worship, and that includes things like Bible reading. I mean, if you're going to grow spiritually, how do you expect to do that without a daily intake of the Word of God into your life? And so you need to find a way to incorporate scripture into the fabric of your life each and every day. You need to realize that prayer is also a key component in our worship where we uh, begin to grow in our spiritual development. A lot of times people say, Steve, I don't even know for sure how to pray. And I just encourage you, pray to God like he's your best friend. Talk to him like he's your best friend because that's exactly what he wants to be. And then thirdly, we need to learn to serve. We need, uh, we need, I'm sorry, we need some time for solitude and reflection. I missed that. But um, we need to, to take some time to, when we're praying, when we're talking about this whole idea of worshiping, connecting, and serving, um, when, if we're going to worship and we're going to connect with God on the level we need to, as we talk to him in prayer, we need to allow him time to talk to us. We need to sit and listen to what the Lord has to say to us. And then secondly, we need to connect. We need to be able to connect with others. We need to connect with God. We need time for community and accountability and connection. And then we need sacrificial service to others. And I, I tell you, moving the focus from yourself to others is a giant shift that has to take place in our lives. That shows that we're moving to a healthier place and a better place. These are just a few of the practices that help sustain the process of spiritual growth. We refer to these things as the uh, weekly three, to worship, connect, and serve. And we think it's a great practice if every person will decide every day to find some time to incorporate these things in your life. If you would take at least an hour a week 
to worship, an hour a week to connect, an hour a week to serve others. What a difference that could make in your spiritual life. You, can, you just can't make spiritual progress without incorporating some spiritual disciplines into your life. We have to take responsibility for rearranging the daily routines of our life in ways that support our decision to grow in Christ-likeness. Our hope would be that three years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, you could look back on a day like this and say, I chose Jesus. And look what God has done. I decided to grow spiritually. I decided to grow in character. I decided to grow in morality. I decided to grow in integrity. I rearranged some of my routines and practices to support and reinforce my decision. And now look how I have grown. Look at the person that I have become. Just look at what God has done. We begin with a decision to change and then we support that decision with a willingness to rearrange our daily habits. And then we'll have to realign our relationships. This is a necessary choice if you're gonna experience significant and lasting life change. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3, 33, I'm sorry. Don't be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Bad company corrupts good character. Whether we care to admit it or not, we are deeply affected by the people with whom we choose to rub shoulders. We talked about this during our guardrail series a few weeks ago. We are deeply affected by our closest associates, our closest relationships, our closest friends. Throughout the history of Christianity, when people wanted to get serious about leaving the darkness and walking in the light of a new life with Jesus Christ, they must give consideration to their current relationships. And some of your friends, you know, they're gonna support you in moving in a positive direction in your life. But if you're honest, you'd have to admit that there are others that are going to pull you in the absolute wrong direction. And this is not just for teenagers. This is not just for college students. This is for all of us. You've got some friends or some associates or family members or colleagues that are going to pull you in the wrong direction. I want to encourage you to make a decision to form intentional, deep friendships with people who are committed to the same things you're committed to. I can put patterns in place in my life in a positive direction, but I, I need some people in a, on a similar path to support my decision to walk with Jesus. And if they see me slipping in areas like character integ or integrity, they can just step into my life and lovingly call me out. Say, Steve, what are you thinking? What are you doing? They can pray for me. They can talk to me about what's going on. They can check on me. And then when things are right, they can cheer me on and encourage me in the process. We all need that. That's the way God made us. We're gonna to have to realign our relationships and put in place some relationships that will support us in these areas. And like the prodigal son, when you're ready for genuine life change, ultimately it's just gonna take a step of faith. You're just gonna to have to step off the dock and into the water. You're gonna to have to take that leap of faith. And my child was lost, now he's found. That story has been repeated again and again and again in the church for centuries. And I believe that this day, it'll be repeated again. Because I have a feeling there's somebody here you can identify really well with that story of the prodigal. Your relationship with your heavenly father today is not what it needs to be. Maybe that's because of apathy on your part or maybe you've been on the run. Maybe you walked away. But today, he's brought you to this moment, to this time, and to this place. And to a reminder, there's room for you at the Father's house. Maybe you've wondered about that, but today there's certainly room for you at the Father's house. And so in a moment as we sing, if you feel that the Lord has spoken to you, would you be willing to just do what the prodigal did? Just stand up, step out, and come home. In this case, it'll mean to come to an altar where I believe the Father will be waiting to meet you with arms outstretched. As you come to him, knowing that he loves you with an unconditional love. 
I want to invite you to have the courage to do what you know you need to do. If the Lord has spoken to you this morning, would you bow with me, please, as we pray? Father, I thank you for those amazing moments of growth that you've brought into the lives of so many here today. It all began with a moment, a moment like this, a defining moment where courageous step of faith was required. Somebody stood up, stepped out, made a decision, a decision they're glad they made today. I pray for many this morning that may be ready to step across the line and make a decision to follow Christ this very hour. Ready to turn their back on the old way of life and to choose a new path and a new direction, a new destination for their future. We realize that nobody drifts into a decision like this. Intentionality is required. And so today I pray for courage to make the right choice, to make an intelligent, spiritual, calculated decision that will impact their life from this day forward. Thank you for the changes and the power that the resurrected Christ wants to make in all of our lives. And thank you for calling us all from darkness to light. In Jesus' name, amen.